Hi guys, I'm back to finish up our discussion about the terrestrial biomes. So, so far we talked about terrestrial biomes um, that exists in the tropical humid climates of the world and in the dryland or arid zones of the world. So those are close to the equator and then close to about 30 degrees latitude. And so today we're gonna jump in and talk about the biomes that are kind of from that point towards the poles. So let me share my screen. Okay, so the next biome that we want to talk about is one that as Californians we are very familiar with, and this is called the Mediterranean shrubland and sometimes also called a Mediterranean woodland environment. And here we have different kinds of shrubs, what are sometimes called scrubs in parts of the world, or kind of open oak woodland types of environments, so trees but much, much more spread out than trees that we would think of in a traditional forest. Um, so on the left, we have a picture of kind of California um, rolling oak woodland hills. This is in the Bay Area. And then we have this picture um, is in the foothills of the um, coming up from the Central Valley into the Sierra that's showing all this kind of um, scrub, shrub type manzanita um, and cenothus, other chemise types of plants. Um, so the plants that live in this area are not as dense, not as fast growing as plants in the forest ecosystems, um, but there is some tree, some shrub, so a little bit more moisture than we had in the deserts or the true grasslands. Um, however, the plants that are growing in this um, environment need to have adaptations to long summer dry periods. So what characterizes a Mediterranean climate as well as a Mediterranean ecosystem is the long dry summer period. So we have a winter period with adequate water, but a long dry summer period with very limited water. And so plants need to either be dormant in the summer, like grasses in California that are green in the winter and spring, and then kind of golden brown all summer when they're dormant, or have some sort of other adaptation to prevent water loss um, during the winter or during the dry summer months. So um, anyway, these ecosystems are it, certainly farther away from the equator, so more seasonality is experienced than in the tropical systems, um, but they're still existing in parts of the world that are adequately warm. We might experience freezing temperatures in parts of the world that support these Mediterranean ecosystems, but we don't have long, like entire winter months where the temperature is below freezing during all parts of the month or for during most of the month. Um, so that's true even kind of where we live. Um, anyway, so uh, when we talked about the Köppen climate systems, we introduced one climate zone of the earth that's called the mesothermal zone. So that's kind of the middle temperature zone and that's where these Mediterranean climates exist. And then you might remember that a Mediterranean climate was one of the kind of subcategories of the mesothermal zone. And so these Mediterranean shrubland or woodland biomes exist within that specific Mediterranean climate. And you'll find this a lot. A lot of times the name for the climate mimics the name for the vegetation where that climate is found. So that's true in the savanna systems, that's true in the Mediterranean climate systems, that's true with deserts, um, and we'll find that's true in other um, biomes as well. So um, we have gone along and talked about anthropogenic influences um, as we've been thinking about these different biomes. And so we already talked about tropical deforestation, but I wanna introduce another um, kind of human influence change, which is a process that's called desertification. So desertification is basically the process where semi-arid areas and vegetation and ecosystems that are supported in semi-arid areas shift increasingly towards becoming deserts. So this is a little bit confusing. Some people think, oh, desertification happens in the desert, and that's not really true. Desertification happens in areas that are desert adjacent, so kind of closer to the equator, that might be a tropical savanna ecosystem, or that might be a, even a tropical shrub ecosystem. And then on the other side of the deserts um, from the equator, that might be the mid-latitude grassland ecosystems that we mentioned before, or now the Mediterranean shrubland woodland ecosystems. So these are all kind of desert adjacent semi-arid type biomes. 
And we're seeing that increasingly these are becoming more and more desert-like. And this is for a combination of reasons. Uh, one, this is just because of global climate change. So temperatures are getting on average warmer and drier areas are seeing less precipitation. So that's changing the climate. Okay, and we know that in part that is because of human burning of fossil fuels, but we'll get more into that topic later. But also this is a human management impact as well. So the way that we actually choose to operate on the landscape can help to maintain um, these more grassland or woodland areas, or we can transform these more rapidly into more desert areas if we're doing things like overgrazing or if we're compacting soil or if we're removing native vegetation and tilling soil too aggressively um, or plowing soil too aggressively, trying to suck too much agricultural productivity out of these systems, we can very quickly transform these systems to be closer and closer to look like deserts. So the picture on the bottom is a picture in California and it's showing on the left a picture that has had lower intensity grazing and then a picture on the right that has higher intensity grazing. So both of these areas experience the same climate, they have the same natural vegetation, but you can see the area on the right now is much less productive. If you did have animals that you were trying to graze, you would for sure prefer to have the area on the left where there would be much more food um, and these would be much more self-sustaining. But past management practices have reduced um, productivity of, of the soils, they've led to soil exposure and soil erosion and kind of left much more desert, low productivity ecosystems behind. So this is an issue that is widely concerning to people. It's happening all around the world. Um, a United Nations report from a few years ago said this process is happening at 30 to 35 times the background rate. And it expects, um, this was a study that came out about five years ago, so 10, 10 years from then, um, 50 million people will be dis displaced because of this process. Um, areas like Syria and Iraq, we know that part of, not all, but part of the political um, strife that has been happening in those areas has happened as a lot of people from rural areas that are quickly desertifying are moving into urban areas um, because they're no longer able to support themselves on these changing landscapes, and that's led to a lot of conflict. So um, desertification isn't new. Um, we have seen desertification happen all the way back in um, kind of ancient empires that existed in kind of semi-arid parts of the world. So we know that there was deforestation in like the ancient Greek and ancient Roman empires. Um, and most historians think that this rapid rate of cutting down of the woodlands that existed in these areas led to higher rates of erosion and then desertification um, in these areas that ultimately decreased soil fertility, made it difficult for them to be able to grow enough food to support the people in their empires, contribute to lots of landslides, filled in, the erosion filled in, there are different kind of water transport canals and infrastructure. And then there's also lots of examples of areas that were previously ports, okay, where they'd be right along the ocean. And there's been so much erosion from upslope landscapes that those ports are now completely disconnected from waterways where so much um, soil has come in and kind of filled in that the po ancient ports are no longer on coastlines. And so this is something that illustrates how the kind of human management um, would have desertified landscapes, um, left them with lower productivity, more desert-like landscapes, um, and then ultimately undermine social systems in the process. Um, one uh, example is that in Greece, there's this monastery at Mount Athos, which has been around for thousands of years. Um, and it has these kind of site, um, what are they, true cedar forests um, around this monastery. And that is like completely at odds with the normal ecosystem that we see today in most parts of Greece shown on the right that are much more barren, much more desert-like. And so this is kind of an example of what we think desertification um, looks like or looked like in this part of the world where people mismanaged landscapes and then left themselves with these much lower productivity um, ecosystems today. And even back at the time, Plato um, had some quotes um, describing what he saw was kind of mismanagement of the landscape. 
Um, his quote says, what now remains compared to with what then existed is like a skeleton of a sick man, all the fat and soft earth having wasted away and only the bare framework of the land being left. So this kind of human management element is not new. Um, certainly more recently we've had um, things like the Dust Bowl that um, were created as humans um, tilled up uh, or plowed up short grass prairie and then found that there wasn't enough rainwater um, to grow the wheat crops that they were trying to grow in these areas and that led to this massive um, wind-blown erosion event during what was a drought but a limited drought in this area and we know that combined with the Great Depression that was going on during this time, this led to lots of um, human suffering. So this was kind of an example of a desertifying landscape process. Um, and then also, even more recently, there was a very infamous event um, in what's called the Sahil, which is this semi-arid area along the southern part of the Sahara Desert in Africa. And in the late 1960s and 1970s, there was like a much more extreme version of kind of a dust bowl type of event um, where somewhere between 100 and 250,000 people died during what was a drought, but not a huge climatic a drought, but a drought that was much exaggerated in its impact by poor human management and overgrazing. Um, and not only people, but estimated 12 million cattle died during this event. So um, obviously humans are very influenced, very Im um, impacted by their ecosystems. And if their ecosystems aren't functioning in the way that they are expecting, um, then that can create a lot of human suffering. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, we're kind of plugging continually away from the equator and um, we encounter an area that's called the broadleaf and mixed. So sometimes both broadleaf trees, those would be trees that don't have needles and mixed. So sometimes these are forests with some needle conifer trees and some broadleaf like oaks. Um, and then they're in the middle latitude. Um, so these are a kind of a mouthful, but broadleaf and mixed middle latitude forests. So these would be a lot of the forests that we see in places like the East Coast that are dominated by um, deciduous types of trees. Okay, a lot of broadleaf trees are deciduous, like the oak trees around here. Um, these areas tend to be relatively high productivity and density. Okay, relative to some of the other systems that we've mentioned recently, but not as productive or dense as our tropical systems along the equator. Um, historically, many of these areas have been removed um, through deforestation um, processes for agriculture by people that have lived in the temperate or middle latitude parts of the world. Um, and fortunately, these areas tend to have kind of slightly younger and more nutrient rich soils than the tropics. And so some of these areas that have been previously removed for agriculture have been able to experience pretty successful reforestation. Um, certainly some of them still are gone until it still are supporting agricultural systems today. Um, but in areas where we have decided that we don't really need to have agriculture in these zones, we've had a pretty good success at reforesting these areas, which is something, as we mentioned before, we're not as confident is going to be a success in these tropical forest systems. So going back to our coping climate zones, this would be one that's associated again with these mesothermal or kind of middle um, temperature zones. Um, and in this case, um, not the driest parts of those mesothermal zones, which are the Mediterranean zones, but more like subtropical humid zones um, that we mentioned um, are kind of home to the broadleaf and mixed middle latitude forests. So another forest zone that we have in kind of middle latitudes is the needle leaf and montane forests. And sometimes um, these forests, especially as they exist in the most um, kind of highest latitude parts of these forests are referred to as boreal forests or um, the taiga. Um, but this needle leaf and montane forest um, can, uh, is considered to include more forests than just what you might have heard of referred to in the past as boreal forests. It would also include forests like um, I've shown in the bottom picture on the slide, which is kind of where we live in mountainous places um, in like the lower 48, 
Okay, so that's not a boreal forest ecosystem, but just kind of a needle leaf montane forest system where we're dominated by like pine trees and fir trees. Okay, so what's different about this type of forest compared to the middle latitude and mixed forest um, broadleaf forest is that it's mostly dominated by conifer trees. So again, those are the trees that have cones and needles like pine trees and fir trees. Um, and these systems tend to be a little bit lower productivity than the mixed um, and broadleaf middle latitude forests. And they also tend to have slightly lower diversity um, than some of the other forests that we've mentioned so far. And these tend to exist in sometimes slightly drier, but also slightly colder climates than the other forest ecosystems, and in sometimes much colder climate than the previous forest ecosystems that we've managed so far. So they have to have adaptations to survive in snowy conditions and wet conditions, um, as certainly at least during seasons. Um, and the colder temperatures are gonna lead to lower evaporation. So in some, though not all, parts of these needle leaf and montane forests, like up in the kind of boreal region of these forests, um, places like um, Canada, we would have probably pretty soggy wet soil. So the plants have to have kind of adaptations um, to deal with that wet type of climate. So, um, so far we mentioned that um, there was mesothermal and microthermal Copen climate zones. And um, there probably would be some mesothermal zones that do contain these um, needle leaf forests, like parts of mountainous California, mountainous Colorado. Those are still considered kind of mostly mesothermal type of zones. But also a lot of this area would be found in the microthermal climate zones um, that we mentioned in our climate zone discussion as well. Um, so. Yes, particularly in kind of like the continental zones of that microthermal um, belt. Okay, so talking about um, anthropogenic influences, deforestation we mentioned in the context of tropical forests, and there's not very high rates of deforestation happening um, in the mixed middle or broadleaf and mixed middle latitude forests and in the needle leaf and montane forest today, there is forest harvesting, but it's usually not a loss of forest. It's like a thinning of the forest and then a regrowth of similar trees within that same forest. Um, but there has been extensive deforestation of these types of landscapes in the past um, in places like China, in places like Europe, and in places like um, North America. So for example, this is a map showing the loss of what this diagram is calling virgin forests from North America from the time that European Americans um, showed up in the early 1600s until today. And so you can see that the dark areas show the virgin forests and you can see the loss of virgin forests from 1620 the, around the Mayflower time um, to 1850 when California first became a state. And then from 1850 to 1920, you can see a massive loss of forests. And then today you can see that virgin forests really only exist in these small pockets, which are normally kind of national and state parks. Um, of course, there are still forests in parts of this country that are not shown as virgin forests, but these are forests that have been kind of regrown um, after they've been originally cleared for agriculture for a period of time or are very, perhaps very actively managed um, kind of forests for wood products. So they're not kind of the natural, necessarily natural forest ecosystems that we would have seen in the past. So something to be aware of. Um, okay, so then um, there's another biome that maybe I could have mentioned before, discussion of deforestation, because um, these areas were deforested as well. Um, but these are also temperate um, forests. These are temperate rainforests, and these are pretty limited in scale, but we find these in some of these coastal, very wet um, areas in places like the Pacific Northwest and even kind of the northern uh, west corner of California where we have the redwood forests that I have shown in the bottom picture here. So these are also mostly dominated by conifer trees, and the climate here is warm enough and very wet to be conducive to these very high productivity density and very high diversity systems 
um, that are more like the tropical rainforest than any of the other forest systems that we've talked about. So they're not as um, diverse, not as productive as the tropical rainforests, but close, um, which is impressive considering that they exist in much colder parts of the world. Um, so these areas are just overall much, much more wet um, than the areas in um, the other forests that we've mentioned. So these are um, usually confined to the Köppen climate zones called the mesothermal zones. And in particular, we talked about the marine west coast zones within the mesothermal zones. This would be where we find these kinds of temperate rainforests. Okay, we're almost done. Um, two more. Um, the next one is the tundra. Um, so the tundra is kind of approaching the poles. At this point, there's not enough concentrated sunlight to create enough light or heat to support tree growth. So we're back to these open ecosystems that we saw um, also around the high pressure zones in 30 degrees, but this time it's not necessarily because they're so dry, but because they're so cold. There's also limited precipitation here, but also limited evaporation. So the ground is often quite wet. Um, instead of grasses, the ground is usually dominated by mosses and lichens. And the cold temperatures here and the limited growing season here mean that we have pretty low density, um, low diversity, and low productivity ecosystems here. So um, we also, like in other ecosystems that are very open, may have large herds of migrating animals um, like caribou um, in these parts of the world. Um, and this area is going to be seasonally very different in the summer. It's going to be kind of snow melting out. And then in the winter, it's going to be covered with ice and snow. And this would be in the Köppen climate zone called the polar region. So when we're thinking about anthropogenic influences, these areas don't have kind of a lot of above ground resources that humans have been interested in manipulating. Um, but there is below ground oil and gas. So a lot of oil and gas exploration has come into these areas, has led to some kind of contamination and concerns about um, certain wildlife like caribou. But another big concern in this area is the melting of the permafrost. So this area is filled with um, frozen soil. So even in the summertime when the surface melts out, if we go down you know, five or six inches below the surface, the soil is completely frozen. And the soil is frozen, but also lots of organic matter that's in the soil is also frozen. And as the climate has been warming up, this soil is starting to freeze. So this is a problem for you if your house or your highway is built on this frozen foundation that's melting beneath you. So there's infrastructure problems associated with this. But also as this, um, uh, frozen soil or permafrost is melting out, it's um, all of a sudden kind of thawing out a lot of organic matter, just like if you had a bunch of frozen broccoli in your freezer and then you took it out and put it on the counter, um, it's, that organic matter starts to decompose and release enormous amounts of greenhouse gas into the air. And the soggy conditions that are found here um, cause a transformation of organic matter to methane gas rather than um, carbon dioxide which is both are greenhouse gases, but methane actually is a more potent greenhouse gas. And so we're seeing a huge kind of climate warming signal coming out from these thawing permafrost systems. Um, so this is kind of an indirect anthropogenic influence. We're not trying, we're not intentionally letting out um, thawing the permafrost, but our fossil fuel burning and our climate warming actions are leading to this um, increase in um, release of methane greenhouse gas. And this would be an example of something that we've mentioned before called a positive feedback cycle. So in this case, what happens in a positive feedback cycle is that an effect of a particular disturbance leads to other changes that come back and kind of magnify or exaggerate the original disturbance. So in this case, the permafrost starts to melt, it releases greenhouse gases, they warm the climate, the climate's warmer, so now more permafrost is melting, so now more greenhouse gases are released, and we get caught in this kind of snowball effect where it's really accelerating the rate of warming that we're seeing on our planet. Okay, last biome is the ice sheets. So ice sheets have no vegetation, so any animals that live here need to migrate out to find food Maybe they hibernate seasonally and migrate. 
in the polar regions. They might go to the edge of the ocean and eat food out of the ocean, um, but ice sheets can also be high up in the mountains. So animals might migrate into these mountainous areas and then kind of migrate down to eat and hibernate. Um, and these are obviously very trying, very low productivity and density ecosystems, and they are changing very rapidly as a result of um, global climate change. So obviously ice, when it gets hotter, is less likely to be ice and more likely to melt to become water. And we're seeing this kind of rapid transformation of these ecosystems as a result of this warming. So last but not least, to remember our Copen climate zones. Um, remember we have both polar and highland zones that are really mimic each other because high temperatures have colder climates just like polar regions. Um, and in particular, there within the polar zone, there was like a tundra zone um, where we find the climate that supports the tundra we talked about last. Um, and then there's also kind of an ice sheet zone that supports ice sheets that never freeze out even if, or never thaw out even in the summer. So um, we also see that um, anthropogenic or human caused fossil fuel related climate change um, is leading to a loss of this ecosystem type. And this also creates a positive feedback, just like the case of the melting permafrost. In this case, where we have um, increased melting of ice, we have a lowering of the albedo or reflectivity of our Earth that we talked about previously. Okay, so when our Earth is less reflective, it absorbs more energy, so it gets warmer, so it melts more ice, so it becomes even less reflective, right? Ice is one of the most reflective surfaces. And when it's replaced with water or soil, the water or soil will absorb energy better than the ice. So we get caught again in this um, warming cycle that's called a positive feedback cycle. And this image shows the sea ice covering around the North Pole in 1980 versus 2010, so considerably lower. Um, okay, so then I just want to mention that again, the highlands really mimic the conditions that we see around the poles. Um, as we move up in elevation, we know air pressure drops, so temperature drops. And so if we climb a mountain, we'll see that we'll have a transition from like forest systems, needle leaf forest systems, to open tundra systems where it becomes too cold um, to support trees. And then we have these kind of alpine tundras um, transitioning into kind of alpine or mountain ice and snow fields. So it's the same kinds of biome transitions based on the same kinds of climate transitions that we see when we climb tall mountains as we see when we approach the poles. Um, okay, that's it.